Okay, uh, please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. This is our second installment on this short series on stewardship. Last week we defined stewardship by looking at ownership and possession. This morning we will begin to look at four dangers of materialism and how that relates to stewardship. At the end of our previous sermon, I defined stewardship as understanding God's ownership over all things, God's authority over his possessions, and our management of his gifts. The recurring phrase that I used in last week's sermon is that God owns everything and we manage everything. Stewardship involves taking responsibility for the things, the people, the duties, the time that has been entrusted to our care. Listen to Romans 14 verse 7. For none of us lives to himself. None of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For this end, Christ died and lived again, that we, that he might be both Lord of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. In this context, Paul speaks about Christian liberty and having the freedom to eat foods. You've got the freedom to eat whatever you want. And there are those who are weak in conscience and can't eat certain foods. And there are those who are strong in conscience and can have certain foods. The one who is weak judges the one who is or despises the one who is strong in conscience. And the one who is strong in conscience despises the one who is weak in conscience. And so Paul, in the context of this, says, why do you judge one another? Don't you understand this? Your stewardship of how you deal with your freedom will be judged by Christ. What you do with your life matters. What you do with your time matters. What you do with your freedom matters. You are free to enjoy whatever you wish to enjoy as long as it is under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Paul ends with a reminder that whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. We are owned by him. In other words, your freedom has limitation. We are slaves of Christ, purchased by Christ. And therefore, we will give an account to Christ for all that we do in this body. See, when we live in freedom apart from the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then we remove ourselves from the yoke of Christ and our liberties become our masters. And then we become enslaved to serving the flesh. Stewardship interweaves with other doctrines such as Slavery and contentment, helping us to understand how important it is to take care of the things that God has given to us. Stewardship involves the use of all our resources, all of our existences, that's not a word, 
all that we are, all that we have, and in everything that we do, everything that relates to us, that we are over, stewardship relates to that, whether it's time management, relationships, purity, wealth, or poverty, all that relates to us is under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So yes, you are free as a slave of Christ. Last week, we saw that God's absolute divine sovereign ownership over all things determines how we need to live as stewards. We are given human responsibility and authority over God's world. Look at Psalm 8, verse 6. You have given him, speaking about man, dominion over the works of your hands. You have granted to man dominion, the right to reign over the works of your hands. And you have put all things under his feet. All sheep, oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the parts of the sea, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. David begins the psalm and ends the psalm with the majesty of God. That is a synonym for the glory of God. In other words, God showcases his majesty or his glory, not only through the things that he's created, but also through the stewardship, the dominion authority that is given to mankind. God shows that he reigns on earth through the authority that is given to you and me over the animal kingdom and this world. This is dominion language, not dominionism. This is authority language, not authoritarianism. This is Genesis 1.26 language, where we are given the right to reign and rule on God's behalf over his creation. It is the works of his hands. It is God's possessions that has been entrusted to you and I. The psalm is not about man. It's about God putting his glory or his majesty on display in what or the authority that he has given to mankind. Let me put it this way. God is glorified when we fulfill our stewardship mandate. Let me say it another way. God is not glorified when we bow down to creation and serve it as we should serve God. The minute creation makes a claim or a mandate over my life, I have subverted my stewardship to it and I dishonor God. The minute we fall to the cult of environmentalism, we have moved from worshiping God to worshiping creation. We are to reign over sheep. That's why I eat lamb chops. We are to reign over oxen and over the beasts of the field. The baboons out in Constantia should not reign over us. Unless you're an evolutionist, then it makes sense. Somebody said that they were here first. Yeah, I don't know about that. doesn't matter if they were here first. God gave this world to us. Stewardship, that we, uh, uh, stewardship implies that we understand God's handing over of his possession, not that he loses it, but the authority of reigning over it to us as his people. Now, we don't see the fullness of that reality yet. Notice what he says in Psalm 8, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. Now listen, all the beasts of the field, do I reign over a lion? I would love to have him as my pet, but I can't. 
because the animal kingdom rebels because of the curse. We do not see the fullness of this yet and we will see it when Christ comes and reigns over this world in the millennial kingdom. Then only will we experience the fullness of what it means to have this dominion authority. For now, all that we can have stewardship over, we are accountable to God for. So then, we are to live with constant awareness of God's ownership over all things and take responsibility for the things that he has entrusted to us. That means time. Let that settle for a moment. How do we deal with time? If God has given you the time to enjoy now because time ceases to exist in the future, we are now limited to the authority of time. We live under the banner of time. We've got to respect it. In fact, Paul says, redeem the time. Be good stewards of time. What about food? Do you reign over food or does, does food reign over you? What about money, family, possessions, wealth? What about spiritual gifts, talents, and even the gospel? We are granted or entrusted these things. We need to care for it and be good stewards of it. We need to live in full awareness of what it means to live as stewards of God's possessions. This will allow us to live free from envy, free from lust, free from covetousness, and free from enslavement. Now, having established what stewardship is, we know its importance. For those of you who weren't here last week, I'm just filling in the gap now. But what are some factors that challenge our stewardship today? What are some areas that cause us consternation or problems as we need to move towards stewardship? I have four, but due to the time, I'm only going to cover two this morning. The first problem that challenges our stewardship is that we don't have the right perspective of money. Often in churches, when we speak about money, it is used or spoken of independently. It is taken out of its context, and all we talk about is giving God more, uh, uh, not loving money, or whatever it is. Money is generally taken uh, to be an independent discussion. However, money falls under the canopy of stewardship. We often hear that the Lord needs our money. Do we give anything to God? We actually don't. So why does God have the principle of giving? We're not adding to his wealth. We're magnifying the capacity of God to glorify himself through the gifts that we give. The Lord doesn't want our money. He owns, as the song says, the cattle on a thousand hills. This lack of understanding with regards to our stewardship and money produces a greater problem. Poor giving is not a result of poverty. I spoke to a guy who was in the THM program um, with me just before one class one night, and he's doing, I think he's in Uganda, he's doing his THM on giving in the African context. And asked him, why are you doing that? He said, because there's so much poverty that people can't give. And I said, no, I don't think that that is true. Poor people can give as well. In fact, God expects poor people to give as well. Read Leviticus. We went through that already. Poor people can often be the most sacrificial givers. The challenge comes when we have more than what we need, then it becomes difficult to part with what we have. The problem is further complicated by two factors. Number one, some are influenced by a pietist or a puritanistic view of money. They say that money is evil. 
We shouldn't have more than we need. Having less is more. And secondly, there are those who say that to the minute we get it, we need to part with it. Don't have lots of money in your bank account. Don't save for a future day. Now let's consider these two problems. Let me begin by asserting that in the context of stewardship, contentment is essential. Contentment drives us to joy and stewardship drives us to Godward and God-glorifying ambition. It's not wrong to be ambitious, but it's wrong to be ambitious apart from seeking to glorify God with all that you have. The enemy of contentment is a heart that is set on greed. But the enemy of stewardship is a heart that is set on self. Does that make sense? When the heart is set on greed, then the outcome will be that which we think satisfies us, such as possessions. When the heart is set on self, then we will fail God in our stewardship. Now let's consider the claim that money is evil. Well, I think this is a simple reality to deal with. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. As I said last week, there will not be a regular series where I'm jumping, uh, where I stay in one passage. I'm going to be jumping from section to section to build a theology of stewardship. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evils. Just in there for now. Very easy. The tense of the verb here is, shows an ongoing reality. The love of money is and will always be the root of of all evil. As long as money exists and wealth exists, there will be those who love it. While money can be used for evil, money in and of itself is not what? Evil. However, our attitude towards our money is a true gauge of our spiritual understanding of money. One man said it this way, I should say one commentator said it this way, our attitude toward money is a true gauge of our spiritual maturity with regards to God's money. Having money is a risk, but also not having money is a risk. So where should we land on this? Well, those who have wealth can be tempted to make wealth their security. But those who don't have can be tempted to covet what they don't have and make what they don't have their God. Both are related to the love of money. Listen to J.C. Ryle, who says, quote, The love of money is one of the greatest snares to a man's soul. The history of the church abounds in illustrations of this truth. For money, Joseph was sold by his brethren. For money, Samson was betrayed to the Philistines. For money, Gehazi deceived Naaman and lied to Elisha. For money, the Son of God was delivered into the hands of wicked men. End quote. Wow. We will sell out God for an extra buck. That's how serious the love of money is. Now, what does Paul mean when he says, for the love of money? This word literally means silver loving or the love of silver. It can also mean, and I think it's in the King James translation where it is translated, covetousness, synonym, which is not an exact correlation, but yeah, it carries the same intent. 
The idea behind this word is that there is a deep, unquenching longing or greed for something that you do not possess. You can't rest until you have it. Something that you will do anything for. So it's not necessarily the love of silver itself, but anything that will provide a source of contentment or security for your life. We often think in terms of just cash in the bank, but this idea in the time of Jesus is a lot deeper than that. Money was not the problem. The problem was coveting, greed. What is the love of money? One author says it is a friend of silver because of the word philos that is in the word. I think it's an oversimplification of the idea. It's characterized rather by a lifestyle of greed, discontent, and covetousness. That is what the love of money is. Luke 6 and 14 says that the Pharisees, they possessed a love of money, controlled by the passion or the desire, the greed for more. 2 Timothy 3 verse 2 explains that the character trait of those who are lost is this, that they are lovers of self and have a love for money. It is interesting that those two go together. Lovers of self are those who have no idea of what stewardship is. They know what possession is, they know what ownership is, but they don't know what stewardship is. And in this context of 2 Timothy 3, it is used of those who are far from God. But in this section, in chapter 6 of Timothy, 1 Timothy, it has the same connotation. Look at Paul's next line. For the love of money is the root of all evil. It is through this, this love of money, this craving for more, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the truth and have pierced themselves with many pangs. They coveted it. They longed for it to the degree that they wandered from the truth. And we can look at that a little bit more on Wednesday. But here it doesn't mean that they were in the truth. They sold their presumed love for God for the love of silver. In fact, Paul contrasts what the man of God should do with what these people does. Look at verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith. Love, steadfastness, gentleness. In other words, instead of pursuing wealth, instead of pursuing riches, instead of pursuing the love of money, pursue righteousness. Why does that sound familiar? Where do you think Paul gets it from? Seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Paul lays out in this section a connection between discontent and godlessness. It seems like these are two different uh, things because even believers can be discontent. And that is true. But he's warning against discontent in terms of pursuing money in the place of God. Notice how he states this in verse 5. And constant friction among people, he's speaking about these godless men who bring about constant friction among people uh, who are depraved in mind and deprived from or of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Thinking that Living a righteous life is a way to make a quick buck. Let me say it in a way that we can understand becoming a pastor or a prophet to become rich. 
such godliness is a farce, Paul says. That is a, an appearance of religiosity, but there is nothing in the heart. Notice how he states this in verse 6. But in contrast to that kind of godliness, godliness with contentment is great gain. True gain is when godliness is coupled with contentment. I'm not saying that believers cannot be discontent. Paul is describing discontentment as an attribute of unbelievers. Those who have an appearance of godliness are those who think that they can make more money by being quote-unquote godly. Look at verse 7. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of all you have is from God. And if God should choose you, choose for your life to end now, guess what? It can go into the coffin with you, but it's not going into glory with you. Lovers 8. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Ouch. Oh. If all God gives us is food and clothing, not a place to sleep. If all that he gives is provision for the day is the idea with that we will be content. That is hard to swallow. The context that uh, Paul is speaking with here is the rise of false teachers. Then what they are doing is they're going from place to place in pursuit of money as they, as they uh, um, disseminate their false teaching. The two go together. False teachers love money. Isn't that true? And he says, we should not be like that. Why? Because we came with nothing into the, this world and we will leave with nothing from this world. But if God chooses to keep us in this world and he only gives us enough bread for today and enough clothes to cover us for today, with that, we will be content. That is a corrective that Paul issues in verse 8 in contrast to the pursuit of godliness without contentment, what the false teachers were doing. Listen to the weight of what Paul is saying. If God strips us from all that we possess, you know what? We will still have contentment in what he provides. See, contentment is not dependent on how much we have, but who we have. Naked we have come into this world, and naked you will leave this world. We've seen quite our fair share of funerals in this last few months. None of those people who have passed on took anything with them other than the salvation, if they were saved, that God has granted to them. You can't take your riches with you. Therefore, the wealth that we should be concerned about, and take note of this because I'll get back to this later on, the wealth that we should be concerned about is not in this life. It's not found here. Now notice the warning. Verse 9, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires and plunge people into ruin and destruction. And you know that he's talking about the false teachers because they cause others to fall into ruin and destruction. Those who are captivated, captured by a desire to be rich. Their hearts are grabbed by love for riches. And this love for wealth leads them away from God and not 
towards God. And it is this love that Paul speaks about in verse 10. For the love of money, the love to be rich, the love that drives us away from God is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, just go back to verse 9 and keep that in mind. But those who desire, who have set their hearts on riches, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires. For the love, that love, of money is the root, is the heart, is the stem, is the kernel of all manner of evil that they can produce. The reason they do so much harm is because their hearts are not set on God. Sadly, what Paul is pointing out here is that they have given themselves over to this love of money. And because of that, they pursue it. And the more they pursue it, the more their hearts are drawn further and further away from God. We see this so many, of, so many times in our world with regards to false teachers. Stories come out of how they've lived, how they've maligned the name of Christ, how they have abused the people of God. Self, love of self drives this desire. When you replace the management of goods, with serving the goods, you've moved from worshiping God to worshiping the things that God gives. This riches does not bring contentment, but it is an entrapment. It is something that God gives them over to. And Paul here deals with the problem that money is not an evil in and of itself. But an infatuation with money will lead you to all kinds of evil. G.K. Chesterton said, quote, There are two ways to get enough. One is to continue to, to accumulate more and more. The other is to desire less and less, end quote. Sounds pretty simple, right? The two cannot coexist at the same time. You can't want more and more and then desire less and less at the same time. Your desire for more will lessen your desire for God. Again, that sounds awfully familiar because Jesus spoke about that. The problem is not that we have a lack of money. The problem is not that we don't give. The problem is not that we have debt. The problem is, problem is that we have a heart that is compromised by covetousness. We want more. And where covetousness exists, their self-pleasure exists. That's why we struggle with stewardship. In the context of what Paul is speaking about here is that false teachers not only pursue love, love of money, but they lead others away from God in their pursuit of money. And isn't that true of many false teachers today? We should not see money as evil, but use money for God. Let me put it this way. Money is an evil master. But... It can be a good servant for the Lord, our master. Did you get that? When you serve money, it will result in all manner of evil. But if you use money for God, you can only do good through that. Our goal should not be to avoid money or even to become rich. If God blesses us, well, praise the Lord. Paul has many um, 
uh, uh, warnings about that. Look at verse 17 of chapter 6. As for the rich in the present time, charge them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Yes, it is for your enjoyment. God gives it, so enjoy it, but don't set your security, your hope, and the finality of your existence on riches. They, the rich as believers, are to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as good as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. I will get back to that, not next week, the next sermon, which will be in four weeks' time. I'm sorry, I'm, not, I'm leaving at the end of the month. The problem that we deal with today is that asceticism, which is very much alive today, has the idea that money is evil. This breeds the idea that the less you have, the more spiritual you are. And so they keep the pastors poor. That is not necessary. I'm not, I'm not asking for money. I'm just saying <laughs> the Lord has blessed us and you guys take care of us um, graciously. Poor people suffer from the same sins that rich people suffer from. Exactly the same sins. On the other hand, as opposed to asceticism, consumerism or materialism is the result of a heart that is set on self and not God. As believers, we can be in both where we think, oh, I, I, can't, I can't own much because if I own much, I, I'm not rich towards God. I'm not a godly person. Or there are those of us who want more because we want to spend more on ourselves. Why does this two areas of confusion exist? I think because we lack the right perspective of money, and I haven't given it to you yet. So not only do people struggle with the right perspective of money, secondly, stewardship is difficult because we don't understand the lure of possessions. Martin Luther said, quote, humanity can be compared to a drunk who falls on the left side of a horse and then gets back up and then falls on the right side of the horse. And as true to Luther, he always brings in the devil. And so he says, he goes on to say, Satan does not care whether you, uh, 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 does not care which side of the horse we fall off as long as we do not stay on the saddle. Do you catch that analogy? As long as you are sitting on the truth of God's word, as long as you are doing what God desires, the devil's not happy with you. So rather act like a drunk man and fall off to the left or fall off to the right. Material and spirituality are not mutually exclusive elements. We live in a material world, yet we are spiritual beings. Gnosticism says that the spirit is good, but material, flesh, is evil. The new version of Gnostic thought today is this. I don't own much, so I must be spiritual. I don't have the devil's horns on my house. You know what the devil's horns are? Oh. You didn't grow up in my period, so an antenna. But I, don't, I don't have a TV, and so I must be spiritual. I don't have DS TV, so I am super spiritual. Or I don't have a car, so surely the Lord is blessing me because I am better than that guy who drives a BM. Not that anybody, oh, sorry, brother. <laughs> I must say, I'm always picking on him. 
I don't know much like other Christians do, so those Christians must not be as spiritual as I am. That's influenced by Gnostic thought. That's the wrong perspective of the problem. On the other hand, materialism is in essence the, a replacement of worship. It's a problem of worship. Listen to what Jesus says. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Also, that is my last sermon. I'll get to that. We know this, but we are oblivious to the weight of that statement. Our tendency is to prioritize ourselves, our loves, our desires. And in the process, we demote Jesus from being Lord over everything that he has given us. And we worship the things that he has given us. We naturally prioritize goods over God. Let me go as far as saying that sometimes we prioritize, no, we worship the things that are reserved for God as if it is God himself. Turn over to Joshua 7. You know the story, so I'm not going to read the entire section. This is Israel trying to invade AI. Um, I've heard that word said differently in, in a variety of different ways. I, yai, it's, it's AI. That's Hebrew um, language. You pronounce every, uh, every syllable. And you have two here. Um, we see the ripple effect of covetousness over the things that are supposed to be dedicated to God. So the narrative here goes from disobedience to defeat, to dismay, to deception, to misdirection, and then finally to death. The difference between Israel's victory is one action. Selfishness demonstrated through covetousness. Now notice verse 1. The entire context is wrapped up in verse 1. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things for Achan, the son of Kami, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things and the anger of the Lord of Yahweh burned against the people of Israel. That is a synopsis of the entire story. And now Joshua will explain how we get to God's anger being burned against them. Now, I'm, I'm not going to read the entire section. I'll just cover uh, it in a very rapid form. See, I think it's 6,000 men, uh, 30, 36, uh, not 6,000, 36 men uh, die as they go out against AI as a result of an action of um, the, the son of uh, Zabdi, son of, uh, sorry, Kami. What happened? Verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Because he's grieved in the fact, for the fact that they've lost this battle. Israel, God's still speaking, has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. Look down at verse 12. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before the enemies. They turn their backs before the enemies because they have become, they, they have become devoted for destruction. This is Israel. And I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. Thus, uh, for thus says uh, Yahweh, your God of Israel. They, they are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. 
You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. Now, you would have picked up, there's a repeated statement in the verses that I've read. What is it? Devoted things. Go back to verse 1. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. So Joshua outlines for us the problem. Things that were dedicated to God has been taken. Things that were supposed to be destroyed in the attack were taken. These must be horrible things, right? Look down at verse 20. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against Yahweh, God of Israel, And this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted. I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. Those are simple things. Clothing, silver, and gold. Now we will frown on the fact that he disobeyed the Lord. Listen, Israel goes out to war. God says to uh, Joshua quite a few times before this in chapter 6, as they go out to fight against Jericho, the devoted things shall be destroyed. You will not take to a hand or your hand will not take possession of anything that is devoted to me, that is to be destroyed. This word devoted things could mean to be utterly burnt or to be utterly destroyed. You get the picture. And he knows as a man of war going in, these things are going to be burnt out. And as they fight, he finds a nice little cloak with a little bit of silver and a bar of gold. Who would not pass that up? Yeah, so don't judge the man. (laughs) Who would not pass that up? Silver and gold is good for trading during that day and to have an extra Coat, man, you are rich. He sees it and he says to himself, why on earth would I waste such a precious thing? He coveted the things which was not given to him to possess. Let me say it another way. The things that belonged to God became so precious to him that he was willing to dishonor God's clear command. That is waiting. If you go back to chapter 6 and just read through it, God clearly tells them, don't take to hand the devoted things. He confesses in verse 20, truly I have sinned and I saw, I saw the beautiful cloak I saw the 200 shekels of silver, the bar of gold, coveted them. Notice what he does with it. He digs a hole and he puts it in the ground. What do you know by now of that action? How how does he view it? It is what? Precious to him. It's a treasure. That's what we see in the New Testament. Treasure is put in the ground. He valued possession more than God. He valued things that belong to God more than God himself. Deuteronomy 13, 17, God says, None of the devoted things shall stick to your hand. Then in Joshua 6, 18, it says, And uh, at the fall of Jericho, Joshua told them, They need to keep themselves free from the devoted things. Yes, God was going to destroy it. God was going to burn it to the ground. God was teaching the nation a lesson. 
You don't need the things from other pagan nations until I tell you to take it. Depend upon me. Why did this happen? Achan's heart was drawn to things more than it was drawn to God. This is an exchange of worship. He prized possessions more than he prized God. He prized the things devoted to God more than obedience to God. In the Old Testament, service, obedience, work, even going to war was an act of worship. And that is why I said it's an exchange of worship. He did not understand the lure of possessions. It's not that you can't have nice things. The problem is that he prized a thing more than he prized the God of the things. Possessions is not a problem, but when our desire for it outweighs or outvalues our desire for God, then we've exchanged the worship of God for the worship of the thing. Achan's sin was driven by a rejection of God's clear instruction of what he needs to do. Losing that tether caused him to make a decision that will end his life. At the end of chapter 7, eventually he is stoned. They burned him in verse um, 25, and Joshua said, why did you bring this trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. And they burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. They built a monument to remind them of the danger of prizing possessions over obedience to God. You may think, well, this doesn't apply to me. I don't have the same desire as Achan has. Our circumstances are not any different. Ask yourself the question, what have I prized more than God? My work? My sport? What about my intellect? My theological education? My capacity to argue, not fight argue, but make a good argument? Sometimes good things can become evil things because the good things takes the place of God. We struggle with stewardship because we don't have the right perspective of money and we don't understand the lure of possessions. Let me end with this. Selfishness is manifested in possessiveness. Possessiveness is manifested in hoarding good things but then the good things become evil things because the good things becomes an idol. We worship it more than we worship God. Sadly, I have to end here because I don't have enough time and we have a baptism um, following. God does not need our money. He, he does not. God requires our obedience. You are free under the Lordship of Jesus Christ to do whatever you want as long as you are willing to give an account of what you do with the goods and the resources and the blessings that he has given to you. Now, for those of you who do not know Jesus Christ the Savior, 
trying to live right and doing things that honor God means nothing to you if you do not have the Lord as Savior over your life. Achan, we do not know if he was a believer. It is possible that he was a child of God in the sense that he was obedient to God in many cases. But at this stage in his life, he prized the thing that God told him not to prize more than he prized God. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful to you for being so patient with us. We see these examples in Scripture, and we can see uh, echoes of it in our own lives, how we do not think rightly about possessions that you give to us. We do not think rightly about our wealth. We do not think rightly about the lure of possessions. Father, help us to think wisely about how we live. Help us to think and live wisely in reference to who you are. Help us to prize you above all things and help us to honor you in every decision that we make with regards to our possessions. Bless us, keep us, sustain us, and guide us, Lord. We need your help. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom. So we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.